Welcome to Indie Film Forum. I'm your host, Kalpana Biswas. My guest today is an award-winning documentary filmmaker, writer, and PR consultant from Chicago, Beverly Siegel. Beverly's first foray into filmmaking came with a collaboration, a film called Blind Love, the story of Josh, about her own family coping with blindness. It was awarded a Chicago Emmy for public affairs programming. A later film, Romance of a People, the first 100 years of Jewish history in Chicago, won a Superior Achievement Award from the Illinois State Historical Society and was aired extensively on Chicago public television. Her most recent film, Women Unchained, about the trauma of Jewish women unable to obtain a divorce without their husband's permission, known in Hebrew as a get, had its international premiere in Jerusalem. It has since been screened at the Pittsburgh Jewish Film Festival on television, as well as at other festivals and screenings on four continents. I'm delighted to introduce you to Beverly Siegel today. Welcome, Beverly. It's, uh, it's such a pleasure having you here. Um, you started as a freelance writer, and you also stood for elected office. Uh, how did that work, and uh, how did you then get into film? Well, um, I was living in Champaign-Urbana, which is the home of the main campus of the University of Illinois, and I was in graduate school in journalism. The year was, oh, 1970, 1971. I actually canvassed for George McGovern in California. When my husband and I, well, he's my late husband now, but when my husband and I came back from California, I was uh, 24 years old, a graduate student, a Chicagoan, and frankly, people with real lives, you know, adult real lives, didn't, who were Democrats, didn't get elected very often in Champaign County. So they said to me, you feel like running. Well, it just so happened that Right then, the 18-year-olds got the vote. And I was a classic case of being in the right place at the right time. I had agreed to run for office. All the students were now voting. I got elected. Then you moved to filmmaking. Then when we moved back to Chicago after graduate school, I was doing a lot of freelancing for newspapers and uh, magazines. And I met somebody who took an interest in my family. At this point, I had a second child. And my second child was born with um, an abnormality in his eyes that ultimately turned out to be a cause of blindness. And um, this man who I met had, had, had done some independent filmmaking work, and he got to know us and said, you know, I'm so, your family's so interesting, I want to make a documentary about you. And I said, okay, I'll be your partner, because I always wanted to do that. So that's what happened. We went into business together and made a documentary about my son. What did you do in, in that uh, process? Yeah, good question, because I certainly didn't know how to hold a camera or press an editing button. I still don't know how to do those things. But um, I'm a writer. And, you know, it was basically about the life, a day in the life of my son and my family. So I um, came up with a shooting plan. Then afterwards, I discovered I mean, it was a very interesting process for me because here we had hours and hours of videotape. And my partner said to me, okay, put it together. Now you become the writer, which was a revelation for me because in documentary work, a lot of what the writer does comes after the shooting. And, you know, as primarily a print person, 
I thought, okay, I guess the way to do this is to approach it like a talking magazine article. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'll think of the video as the pictures that are going to be in my story. And then I quickly discovered that that is absolutely not the way to do it. Because when you're working in a visual medium, you've got to tell your story visually. Mm -hmm. It seems so obvious, and yet I you know, just kind of learned that on the job. And one of the great things I discovered from doing it is that I actually was able to do it, and that I liked doing it, uh -huh. and that it I was pretty good at it. It, it is so exciting. I, it just that whole process of, it, it's like a jigsaw puzzle that you yes. kind of put together in, into this beautiful picture, into a beautiful frame. Subsequently, you moved on to a larger project where you talked about, uh, you know, you tackled the whole Jewish history, uh, the, the whole uh, story of a community. Now, that's a whole different ball game. Uh, much more challenging, I would think. Challenging in a, in a very different way. The Chicago Jewish Historical Society came to me and said, we want to tell a hundred years of Chicago Jewish history. Would you work with us on this? Mm -hmm. So I said, yeah, I would love to work with you on this. I'm a Chicagoan. I, my mother's a Chicagoan. My whole family, we are all Chicagoans. I had 11 consultants and a limited budget and we went to work figuring out how to distill a hundred years of history. So what was the heuristic? How did you go about doing it? The people who were my core um, collaborators at the Chicago Jewish Historical Society said to me, here's the book, make the documentary. The book is about 800 pages long. It's like an encyclopedia of, oh, Minutia, a million details of things that happened along the way with hundreds of biographies of people who, you know, so-and-so came to Chicago in 1876 and he did this and he married her and she did this and how do you tell the story of a community mm -hmm. with that detail? And so I said to them, well, what's the plot? I mean, who's in, who's out? How do we, you tell me, you're the historians, I'm the filmmaker. What story do you want told? And they kept insisting, well, here's the book, figure it out. I said, no, this is not possible. So they finally said, okay, look, there is a man in Cleveland who's considered the Dean of American Jewish Historians. Mm -hmm. Call him and ask him, what is the story that we're trying to tell? So his name was um, Jacob Rader Marcus. He's no longer living. He said, here it is. This is the story of any community. The Jews came to a new place. They came from Europe, but they came from a lot of different countries in Europe. Mm -hmm. They came not knowing each other. They came not speaking the same language. Jews from Poland, Jews from Germany. They came not observing the same Jewish rituals. They had biases against each other. They didn't even particularly like each other. So you had all these disparate Jews coming from all these places. They land in this swamp known as Chicago. And how did they form a community? So that's where you have to begin. You have to begin by they came. They had to overcome certain challenges in establishing themselves. Mm -hmm. They had to form a community. What problems did they encounter? with the other people who were there, with each other. What did they have to overcome to become a community? And then, what did they accomplish once they did those things? I'd love to watch a clip of that, uh, so let's go I'd ahead and do that. I'd love to show you. In 1833, as the Potawatomi Indians left the plain near the Chicago River, where it flowed into Lake Michigan, Chicago was incorporated with 350 residents. Its strategic importance was quickly recognized, and it became the fastest growing city of the 19th century. The new city needed people with skills and ambition who were willing to leave the familiar behind. The problems of the old world and the enticing promise of the new brought people to Chicago.
The city had no sidewalks, but business opportunities were abundant, and Jewish immigrants took advantage of them. Michael Greenbaum, my great-grandfather, was a tinsmith and plumber, and when he came here, he opened his own shop. And in 1848, he married his cousin, Sarah Spiegel. They had a house on Union and Randolph, and they filled it soon with 10 children. Isaac Ziegler, who began as a peddler, opened a store near Clark and Madison. Henry Horner opened a wholesale grocery near Canal and Randolph. He became one of the founders of the Chicago Board of Trade. In 1933, his grandson would become the first elected Jewish governor of Illinois. Chicago's first minion, a Jewish prayer group, was held in 1845 above a store near Lake and Wells. The group used biblical scrolls brought west from Bavaria by the Cohn brothers, Abraham, Hirsch, Meyer, and Julius. Since Chicago had no kosher meat, their mother, Dyla Cohn, ate none and soon grew frail from malnourishment. That problem was solved in 1847 when Abraham Cohn helped form Chicago's first permanent synagogue, Kehilath Anshe Marif, or Community of Men of the West, which was located on the site that is today the Kluzinski Federal Building. Congregation KAM brought Rabbi Ignaz Kuhnreuter to Chicago, both to officiate at religious services and to serve as Chicago's first kosher slaughterer. The new American environment created new opportunities for the Jews of Chicago, but it also created new tensions. You had Jews from Hungary, from Germany, from the Slovakias. Each came from a very different culture. So when they came here, they found other Jews who didn't know their ways, and there was a real tug of war between them. KAM started as Orthodox, but was moving towards reform. A group of people were not satisfied that KAM should move toward reform, so they broke away and formed B'nai Sholem. Another group said, you're not moving fast enough toward reform, and they founded the first reform synagogue in the city known as Congregation Sinai. The Jews of Chicago, like other groups, rallied to the Union cause. Of only 1,500 Jews living in Chicago, 96 men enlisted in an all-Jewish unit that became known as the Concordia Guards. The Chicago Tribune wrote, the rapidity with which their company was enlisted has not its equal in the history of recruiting. As part of the 82nd Regiment Infantry, they fought in the battles of Atlanta and Gettysburg and joined in Sherman's march to the sea. The Chicago fire broke out on the Jewish holiday of Simchas Torah on October 8, 1871. Five of the city's seven synagogues were destroyed. After the fire, the Chicago Jews, obviously, like everyone else, had to rebuild. They had to rebuild their homes and their businesses. Many of them went into banking and insurance and manufacturing. So they participated very actively in the economic building of the city. They also were interested in the cultural building of the city. And although they didn't get into all institutions, they became very active in a number of cultural institutions of Chicago. In the early 1890s, the city's German-Jewish elite helped avert a crisis that threatened the University of Chicago. The founders of the University of Chicago were attempting to establish for the city not a local institution, but an academic institution that would be like Harvard or Yale or Cambridge or Oxford uh, on the premise that the city of Chicago deserved that prominence. And during the early stages, they found themselves uh, struggling financially to keep the process going. And at that time, uh, they, they made an appeal for assistance, and the Jewish community um, came very generously to the aid of the founders. And as leaders of the university uh, later acknowledged, without that support at that critical juncture, uh, the university itself might never have come into being. So Beverly, that was a lot of information to pack into a film. And uh, it gives this really interesting history of the community. So what was the impact that it had? Well, it ran for four years at a fr as a freestanding special on WTTW 11, uh, which is Chicago's flagship public television station. Um, and it was used in many, many educational programs for small groups and classrooms. You made several films thereafter, but uh, your current one, which I think is really interesting, uh, is called Women Unchained, about uh, the, the Jewish problem of divorce. Uh, yeah. in Orthodox uh, Judaism. I have a friend in Chicago whose daughter couldn't get a get. Now, you need a little background here. Yes. A get 
is the word for a religious divorce in Judaism. So to be really divorced religiously, according to Jewish law, a woman has to get a get from her husband. Also according to Jewish law, a man, a man has to give it to his wife. It's not that a woman can give it to a man. The, woman, the woman's job is to receive it. The man gives it, the woman receives it, and the man has to give it of his own free will. So that is the problem. What if the marriage is really broken down, but the man isn't giving his wife a get? Why? Well, there are different reasons why men sometimes withhold a get, and you know it gets kind of caught up in the ugliness of divorce, but sometimes a man maybe just out of vengeance, doesn't want to lose his wife, doesn't want to break, see his family broken up. Sometimes the man wants money. Sometimes what gets a man to give a get of his own free will is some sort of payoff or bribe or extortion. I mean, they're not pretty words, but that's the problem. So I have a friend whose daughter could not get a get. Finally, she did get her get, my friend's daughter, but it cost my friends a lot of money, about a half a million dollars. Wow, yeah. that's a lot of money. Uh, and, and are you saying that the woman cannot move on? Uh, well, it's an interesting question because the woman with, a woman without a get can't, cannot move on in the Orthodox Jewish world anywhere in the world or in Israel. So if you were married according to Orthodox Jewish law, and you don't have a get, you simply cannot remarry in that world. And you might say, well, big deal, drop it, forget it, just go get married, have a civil marriage, you know, do, you know, go on with your life. The problem with that is that if a woman without a get has a child with a man who she is not married to according to Jewish law, that child is stigmatized. The child becomes what's called a mamzer, and it's it's an Ill, illegitimate child, which you know in the secular world really has no meaning. Who cares, you know? But the problem is that within the Orthodox Jewish world and in Israel, someone who is a mamzer isn't free to marry within the Jewish community. Their marriage prospects are very limited, so really no woman wants to inflict that status on her child. And that's why, um, that's why the extortion works. So this is a very painful topic, a very complex topic. Um, were you able to get people to participate in this? I mean, these are very personal mm -hmm. stories. I love that question because that's part of why this film took eight years to make. You can get someone to talk about it who's gone through it. You know, once you're looking back on, an, on, on a situation that's over, you're done with it, women are more free to talk about it. But a woman who is going through it is very reluctant to talk about it, especially in a way that would work on camera. Because she's, all that woman wants is for her husband to give her a get. She's not looking to become the star of a documentary. What did you want to achieve with it? Well, first of all, my friend whose daughter couldn't get the get, she said to me, I want to do something to expose this terrible problem. We must bring this problem to the attention of the, of, of the Jewish community. We were looking for something to really shake people up. We were looking to be part of an advocacy movement. You know, we wanted to basically put something in the face of the community, of rabbis, of leaders, and say, look, this is the problem that exists in our community today. What are you going to do about it? There was a time when this problem was very, very rare in the Jewish world. But it's become much more prevalent, and part of the reason is that the divorce rate has skyrocketed in the last, say, 20, 30, 40 years. You know, there are other options, but the problem is in the Orthodox Jewish world is you've got to get major rabbinic leaders to agree on an option. If they don't agree, there's no solution. Mm -hmm. There was a rabbi in the 80s and 90s who was very bold and courageous and he started his own religious court 
to issue annulments to women who couldn't get a get. Now, to the Western ear, that sounds strange. How do you annul a marriage where there are a lot of children? Uh, you know, what is, what are the, what's the repercussion of that? But in the Jewish world, that isn't a problem. It doesn't affect the status of the children, but it means that the woman is somehow free to remarry without the need of a get. The problem was that no other Orthodox rabbis would acknowledge as valid those annulments. Mm -hmm. About 500 women got those annulments. In fact, my friend's daughter had gotten one of those annulments. But it's like, you know, that and a quarter. What are you going to do with it? You know, so, so, there, so there is another solution now, and it's, it's called a prenuptial agreement to prevent get refusal. We have a scene about it in the film, and that solution really is becoming, it seems, the wave of the future. How has the film been received? Some people find parts of it controversial. You know, it exposes a harsh reality. Um, but the film has, has been, you know, it's, it's been featured on four continents. You know, it's had two long television runs. It's played at prestigious Jewish film festivals. You know, people talk about it. Mayim Bialik is the narrator of the film. That attracted a lot of attention. So it's, it's been really well received. And, and what's most gratifying to me is that a lot of people say to me, and you know, women and rabbis and just a lot of people, that the film helped raise awareness of the prenuptial agreement and that it's really making a difference. This is a, such an important film. Uh, we are going to play a clip from it so that people can get a sense of exactly what this is about. Stop the abuse! Stop abusing halacha! Women are people too! Now, th these husbands extort money from their, from their wives, and Rabbi Blumen fans get, get the portion of it. According to Jewish law, a Jewish woman may not remarry until her husband gives her a special writ of divorce. It's known in Hebrew as a get. All we want is a get. That's all I want. Nothing. Just a get for my daughter. That's all she wants. This man is advising Ariel to keep my sister a hostage. I'm a gunna. If he refuses to give her a get, she becomes an aguna. She is a chained woman, a prisoner in a dead marriage. In ancient times, an Aguna was a woman whose husband was lost in battle or at sea, with no witnesses to verify his death. These days, she is typically a woman whose husband's whereabouts are known. The marriage is broken beyond repair, but he refuses to give her a get. No one knows exactly how many chained women there are, but women's rights advocates say the number is growing. It was an abusive relationship. And then by the end, he was actually taking food away from me. I weighed 88 pounds when I left. The Jewish divorce rate is going up. We estimate that now one out of four or one out of three marriages ends in divorce. As there are more divorces today, more men are in a position to blackmail their wives. He did not directly say to me, but through rabbis who negotiated, he told me that for $100,000, he'll talk to my husband to give me a get. No one knows the price that a chained woman will pay for her freedom. And in the book of Deuteronomy, and what we call in Dvorim, in the uh, chapter called Kiseitze, it says the husband must initiate the get. says he shall write to her a safer crisis, which means a book of cutting or rending asunder.
some Jews are surprised to discover that Jewish law still affects them. I'm uh, a flexodox uh, Jew, and uh, you know, I never gave my wife a get. She never asked for a get. I don't even think she knows what a get is. Were you happily married? Well, until, uh, you know, time to get divorced. Dawn Steele was one of the most powerful women in Hollywood. But before she could marry Chuck Roven, Chuck's mom insisted that Dawn go back to her first husband and ask for a Jewish divorce. You want to marry my son, honey? You're a Jewish woman. First, you get a get. So, she did. Some of the ladies at this table don't need a get. She's putting on God a show. Care of that for us. The importance of a get cannot be overestimated. If she were to just get, a, let's say, a civil divorce, if she were to remarry with it and have a child, that child would be considered illegitimate. Her children will become mamzerim, which are uh, translated loosely as bastards. Mamzerim cannot marry other Jews, they can only marry other Jewish bastards. So it's similar to having a scarlet M on every single child of a woman who remarries or has children without having obtained a get from her husband. Hundreds of thousands of Jews in America, if not millions of Jews in America, have very strong Jewish identities and have no connection at all to the Orthodox rabbinate. But should any one of those Jews come to Israel and seek to get married, they will have to provide certification from a recognized Orthodox rabbi. Did you ever ask my children, did you ever ask their father how they eat, how they dress? I said, take a look, he's dressed in European clothes. I said, what has he given his kids? I said, you talk about my children? How dare you? It took me approximately three and a half years of hearing after hearing in which the husband would pound the table and say, I want the children to come back, and if they come back, then I'll think about giving her a get. Finally, I was able to get him into a position where he admitted that even if the children were here, he wouldn't give a get. You are the reason that my children wouldn't be religious. I said, because you haven't fulfilled your jobs. To come and tell me that you've never read my file, and all of a sudden you've forgotten that he was sleeping with someone else? Oh, you've forgotten this. There was one judge in particular who was very much proactive in this matter. He wrote a four-page opinion. When it went up to the back up to the Supreme Court on appeal, it was at that point in time that the Supreme Court agreed to go along with my request to put the husband in jail. And they did it. And after three months, he decided that enough was enough. We were about to have him put into solitary confinement. And on the Friday before Purim, uh, he said, if you get me out today, I'll give her a get. Thank you, Beverly, and thank you for watching Indie Film Forum. I'm Kalpana Biswas. See you again next time. For more information on Beverly Siegel and Indie Film Forum, please visit our websites coming up. Thank you.